Welcome to the Lockdown Live podcast. All podcasts are available on our YouTube channel. And if you're enjoying the content, please hit the subscribe button. My name is Jamie Flynn, and you can get in touch with me on Twitter at jam underscore fly. Today, I'm joined by a bona fide Irish poker legend. Like the most considerate member of a threesome, he came third in the 1999 World Series of Poker main event. And during his career, he has amassed <laughs> over 1.8 million in live career earnings. Welcome to the podcast, Paul Parkinson. Thanks so much, Jimmy. I should, bet, I, I should mention I spent 1.9 million while I was doing that. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> probably just a lesson there in itself for our younger listeners. As you're as you're aware, Park, uh, poker, poker tournament earnings. It's all about the 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 earnings these days. Nobody's worried about expenses or buy-in. So, uh, one point eight million is the figure that that we roll with. You know. Ah oh, well, I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, you can you become uh, you can get into the top ten in the world and, and be doing your bollocks. Like, <laughs> I mean, um, no, nobody asked what, what was any of that profit, <laughs> or who paid the expenses. That's it, exactly. Yeah, there's uh, we we see we see that a lot these days. Um, so how how's how's lockdown trading your park? What what part of the world are you in? I'm uh, I'm in a laneway, and that's a cul-de-sac. When there's only about eight houses on it, and it's half a mile long, and it's two miles outside Ballymahon. And if the coronavirus catches me here, it it would be doing better than the postman because he hasn't felt it in about six months. <laughs> okay, safe, safe, safe place to be. So it's great being down the country during lockdown. I mean, there's no advantages to being in Dublin except yeah. that you're a lot closer to a lot of places that you'd like to go, but you can't. Exactly. <laughs> down here, it's just the wide open countryside, the fresh air. I mean the the weather's fantastic. Um, you can be sitting outside sipping beer, beer or whatever your tipple is in the afternoons, and uh, it's not too bad. So mm. I'm beginning to get a bit fed up of it at this stage. <laughs> like yeah, it is. Um, I think it is. Yeah, it is, it is wearing thin for some people. But uh, as I said, yeah, being outside the city is definitely, uh, definitely a plus. Um, yeah, so well, you... for poker, uh, I mean, you know, you see the government coming out with this big long list, you know, uh, the five stages and all of this, and they're on about when they're opening chiropodist and uh, 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 beauty parlors for dogs and every fucking thing. But the, nobody the has mentioned things. the poker at any stage. Like uh, the, the Vintners Association are saying, well, they don't, they don't agree with that. We, we're going to open up six weeks early. And uh, and throw the drink at the customers or whatever, but there's no mention of the poker or anything. So I'd say poker is probably still a long way down the line. It's yeah, it's certainly so looking like that. I th is. Yeah, I, I think it definitely could be the last thing to come back. Uh, the live poker. It's uh, yeah, as you said, us us poker players are second class citizens in a lot, in a lot of ways, and um, they're not not too keen to to welcome us back with open arms. I think. No, well, I think. Um, a lot of the poker players aren't uh, very keen to go back either. Like I, I've been talking to guys from all over the country in the last few weeks because I've not, nothing else to do. And uh, I mean, the feeling amongst a lot of the players is that they don't want to go back until it's safe, you know, until there's mm -hmm. a vaccine or at least a cure. Um, that I mean, that everybody wants to go back to playing live. Like yeah. people don't want to sit at home playing on the internet, but. Uh, they don't want to go back to playing live when there's a chance it might kill you. And then I can see their point. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, th I think that's what's going to have to happen to get the live back. You know, I've like seen all sorts of complicated tables with um, screens and the whole thing. Mm. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work. And there was, I was talking to Mike Sexton the other day, and he was saying that there was talk in Vegas of three handed poker. Mm. I mean, God Almighty! You know, what I mean, yeah. You know, it, it, it's like you have a whiskey and coke without the whiskey. Like, <laughs> um, I can't, I can't see that going. 
yeah i i, I can't imagine um well, i i think it's just uh casinos are just the joe you know, they're going to be the biggest hotbed for for germ spreading and you're touching chips and cards and everything so uh i think it, it's it'll definitely be one of the last things to come back and whether whether it comes back in some shape or form before a vaccine uh i don't know it's very hard very hard to see now uh unfortunately but um it's just have to have to wait and see but it it it, it makes sense why uh as well though i think Oh yeah, I mean, like you can probably have uh, um, blackjack with you know with two people to a table, maybe roulette yeah. with four. But even then, I mean, you're dealing with chips, you're dealing with money, and uh, and you know there's a lot of hand washing and the whole lot that still won't guarantee anything. But I mean, no. you can bring back the casino in some form, but the the poker is just going to have to go to the bottom of the line. But I mean. It'll be better if, if we're all back playing and all safe than, uh, than if we have to take a few casualties along the way. That's it, yeah. Like, uh, you, know, Tim, you know Tim Farley had uh, got the virus? Oh, really, yeah. Dublin player. Yeah, he, he picked up the virus. You know, he does this um, drum, no, uh, piping. In his pipe band, some guy uh, got the yeah, virus. Yeah, the, and, the, the and they all got uh, put, yeah, yeah. They all got put into uh, lockdown and tested, and Tim had the virus and uh, had a dodgy couple of weeks, but uh, thankfully he came to the other end. But there's a lesson there for all of us. Don't play the bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah. I, I wasn't familiar with that. I, I never even realised that, though. <laughs> I I can't believe how he was out playing the bagpipes during during a coronavirus epidemic. What was he thinking of? <laughs> As I said, yeah, the uh, the the yeah, the uh, it might it mightn't be the most suitable joke now, but uh, yeah, the, the bagpipes are often played at the funerals, so he might be getting he might be getting more work in the coming weeks. <laughs> so we might have to edit that one out. I'm not sure now if that's the most suitable. Oh, yeah, one. Can, yeah, uh, my thoughts are with Tim and uh, delighted <laughs> delighted he's gone oh, through no, this Ah no, 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 Tim is fine now, and the other guys are grand. Just keep practicing, lads. <laughs> Plenty of work. Um, so, Park, will uh, c- could you tell me a bit? Could you tell me a bit about your your early life? Um, kind of where you grew up and how you first got into your first introduction to gambling. Uh, well, I did a bit of dabbling uh, in school and all of that, but um, I then I went to Trinity College. And spent four years there playing poker all day and playing bridge all night. And uh, I think uh, they finally gave me a degree and flew me out, I think, just to try and bust up the poker game. But, uh, <laughs> but I, w- I kind of went straight after that and got a real job. And um, every now and again ran into uh, a few house games, you know, involving... Uh, I think I played a house game with Dave O'Neill, Peter Mabasha, a few of those guys from back in the day. And um, there was a game in Dublin called the Jewish game, which was a huge game, but uh, it was soft enough. But uh, I th- when I really, but I mean, most of the time I was working and um, for six or seven years. But then I heard about the Eccentrics Club in Dublin. Hmm. And that Terry Rogers had found it after being in Binions and... Uh, watching the World Series going on there. Terry became friendly with uh, Benny Binion, and Benny told him how it all worked. So uh, Terry was absolutely fascinated by it. And when he got back to Dublin, he founded the Eccentrics Club up on Handon's Corner. And uh, that became, that was the start of No Limit Hold'em tournaments in Europe. Mm. I mean, th- th- that was it. It all started in Ireland. and. Um, the Eccentrics Club was, I mean, this place was magical. I mean, I, I heard about this place. I walked in there one night, and the first person I met was Terry Rogers, whom I knew from the racetrack, but, I mean, only to watch in action. He was great crack now to watch yeah. at the track. <laughs> but uh, And he introduced me to Colette Doherty, whom I knew from the newspapers, had won the Irish Championship, and sent, told her to bring me upstairs and get me something to eat. And then I went downstairs and played with guys with names like, uh, you know, um, Daisy and Johnny Suitcase and Big Jim 
and I don't think anybody had their own name. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and it, it was just like, it was like walking into something out of Damon Runyon. Yeah. Uh, it, it was just an unbelievable experience. And uh, after that, I, I was hooked. There was no stopping me. Like, and yeah. that was just a little club that was uh, just around the corner from the pub, from Handland's pub. It was kind of the upstairs part of a shop with two stories. And uh, that was the, the club. I mean, there was a blackjack table, a few poker tables. And then there was an upstairs with another table or two that came into use when there was the Irish Open. But that's where it all began in Europe and it all began in Dublin. And like a little known fact is that out of that club, uh, six guys made the final table of the World Series of Poker <laughs> over the years. Really? Yeah. I mean, this was a club where like on a Tuesday night, there would be maybe two tables. On, if it was very busy, maybe three. But out of that came six WSOP final tables. I mean, you could take a whole country like uh, like the UK, and they haven't had six uh, final tables in the main event. And the little the little the little club above the shop in in the in, in the north side of Dublin produced six. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um... The yeah, t- t- Terry Terry Rogers. Um, I think is yeah. Uh, f- for for people who aren't kind of familiar with him, um, uh, I think possibly had Joe you know, the, the the biggest influence on poker in Europe. You know more than anyone. I think. Um, you you, you said you, you, did you meet him first uh, at the race? So he was he was a he was a bookmaker. He was a lot of things. He was a bookmaker, a promoter. Um, he was involved in bringing Muhammad Ali over to to Dublin. So he was uh, had his finger in a lot oh, of pies. Was he involved in that? Uh, he, he was. Yeah, I, I read an article during the week. Um, the uh, he was involved in bringing Muhammad Ali over to uh, over to Dublin, and um, the the press conferences were um, over oh, Al Blue Lewis. Yeah, yeah, I th- yeah, I think that, yeah, um, and uh, the, yeah. Whom nobody had ever heard of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and all the, the, the press conferences uh, happened to be in a, in a the, the head office or the media office was uh, located uh, above his bookmaker shop in uh, Dublin, so um, he did. Oh, of course, of course it was. <laughs> yeah, he knew what he was doing. Um, what, oh, he was yeah. a marketing genius, you know, ter- Bit bipolar and got and and uh, and maybe three quarters bipolar and a quarter mad. <laughs> but I mean, um, when it came to marketing, uh, he was miles and miles ahead of his time, and was I mean, and just a, an extraordinary character. Mm. Um, and it, he was responsible for. The, I mean, the, the year the year after that, uh, Terry had um, set up the Eccentrics Club. That wasn't good enough for him. He, uh, he, he got on to Benny Binion and Benny sent a plane load of the best players in the world to Dublin. I mean, the, the poker hadn't even started in Europe. They were all still playing five card draw jacks to open or something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Terry had uh, Doyle and uh, Chip and Stewie and Slim and Puggy. The whole lot of them, a whole plane load of them. I mean, um, came over to Kalini Castle for a week and uh, Terry had a tournament for them there. I mean, this was like 1982. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading about this in the papers and Jesus Christ, like, <laughs> how much is to buy in? It was like two grand as a well, okay, well, maybe next year. <laughs> Take a look at that one. But I mean, what an extraordinary piece of marketing. I mean, he's got the best players in the universe. They're all yeah. up in um, Kalini Castle. But we, we were up there um, at Dunico D and I were there uh, three or four years ago with a German guy um, who was uh, doing a, a documentary. And uh, we were up talking about uh, uh, here the Americans came to town. Quite funny because I wasn't even there. But it didn't stop me doing most of the talking. <laughs> but uh, Donica told an amazing story. And that was, you know, like the 
the Americans were, were all arriving over and they were, I mean, lo- laden down with cash. And, you know, they'd go up to the, um, to the desk in the, in the Kalani Castle and say, can you hold on to this envelope? And they'd say, yes, certainly, Mr. Unger, and uh, put his envelope in the thing. And everybody, everybody had their bank roll in the, in the safe in, um, in, in the Kalani Castle. I mean, normally people would leave their passports or maybe uh, a few a few trinkets. I mean, but that was it. And so the hotel got suspicious after two or three days because people kept coming up. I mean, you could go up to the to the desk in the Kalani Castle and say, "I'm um, Mr. Brunson. Can I get out?" Can I have my envelope, please? They give him the envelope, turn his back, take something out, put it in his pocket, and then he's uh, and then he's gone, and the envelope is back in the thing. So somebody somebody asked at some stage, what's going on here? And well, it's just money for the for the poker. Yeah. So they they cornered Terry, and they said, well, make it. Uh, how much is in our safe? And Terry said, well, it's probably not more than half a million. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I think the previous record was probably 1,500. And that was probably in <laughs> wedding gifts. <laughs> but the management of Kalini Castle just almost had a heart attack simultaneously. Like, and uh, said to Terry, no, we're not. When it happened that like we're only covered for five grand. <laughs> so Terry uh, took all the envelopes up to his room and had an armed guard, or well, two armed guards that were doing 12 hour shifts. And there was an armed guard in Terry's room with the readies for the rest of the week. And uh, it was eight o'clock in the evening, he'd go home, and the other guy would uh, would come on. And and he'd sleep or he'd sit in the chair beside Terry's bed while Terry was sleeping, <laughs> making sure nobody stole the money. God, Jesus, yeah, yeah. But like, I, I mean, but nobody seemed to think that was unusual. You know, it was um, poker was a very strange game in those <laughs> games, I and mean, because uh, just such a big percentage of the players were characters. I mean, the bizarre, the bizarre became kind of normal. Yeah, um, I think, and um, so I, like I, anything I, went. I mean, quite, quite well, similar like nowadays. Jewish, I think they're saying, "What's all the fuss about? It's only half a million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah. The I I think the the characters in poker, especially uh, yeah, in those days, uh, as I said, we still there's there's still plenty of them around today. But uh, yeah, back then. Um, they said when there, there, there was no bank accounts, no, uh, well, sorry, there was obviously oh, bank accounts, bank but account. th- th- there, there wasn't exactly, um, uh, I know Stu Unger, he, he, he wasn't a fan of uh, putting his money in a bank. Uh, if he wanted to access it at 4 a.m. on the Thursday, he'd have to wait for the bank to open. So he wasn't, uh, wasn't too happy with that. Well, well, half the people he was playing in the game were bank robbers, so he, he knew what yeah. the risks were. More than anybody. I mean, I mean, Mike Sexton used to say that uh, that there was never a, a good a, a good game in Vegas without a bank robber and a drug dealer in it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. I mean, banks forget about it. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Stewie, Stewie, when he came to Ireland. Um, had to get a passport because he'd never had one before. Yeah, yeah and uh, not surprised. Yeah, he went to the passport office to collect it. He's collected his passport and he and he's tipped the guy three hundred bucks, which was a lot of money in nineteen eighty two. <laughs> and the guy was trying to tell Stewie, no, no, we can't take that. And Stewie, he says, what's wrong? Is it not enough? <laughs> 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 what's going on here? Yeah, 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 I mean, Mike, Mike Sexton used, used to hang around with Stewie a lot. But, but, but they were very strange combinations, you know, the, the straight of good old Southern guy and the, and the New York nutcase. But they were, uh, what they did have in common was that they were both degenerate gamblers. <laughs> and um, 
but they uh, they actually uh, had a very very strange friendship, like uh, going back over the years. But uh, I mean, uh, I've been listening to Stewie's stories from Mike for years. Like I mean, and nothing nothing would amaze me at this stage. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, uh, the 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 degenerate gambler gene is, um, I think, is stronger than anything. Uh, as you said, whether you're from whether you're from um, North Carolina or New York or Texas or Dublin or Paris, um, the 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 gambler gene is is the strongest, and that uh, that trumps all. I think uh, we can we can relate to each other as gamblers. I think no matter what part of the world you're from or what religion you're from, or you know, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, sorry, we're having some having some technical issues there. The the internet was bleeping. Uh, sorry, go on, Park. Yeah. No, no, just said the just the degenerate gambler gene. This is, it, I think, it overrides everything. Absolutely. And um, some like Mike just has some amazing stories about what Stewie used to get up to. Um, just I mean, it, it didn't. The guy just didn't care. Or no respect for money whatsoever. Like, um, and Terry brought all these guys over to Ireland to contaminate us. <laughs> That's it, but, yeah. But apparently, uh, a star was born in the middle of all of that. Uh, Noel Furlong, who lived in Killiney, was out walking his dogs. And uh, he's, he's walking by the Killiney Castle and he sees uh, Terry there outside the hotel. So he went in to say hello, and Terry told him, he asked him what was going on, and Terry told him there was a poker tournament with all the big Americans over. So Furlong brought the dogs home, and I mean, Furlong didn't know how to play poker, except for like, you know, a bit of draw poker. Hmm. And like two hours later, he's winning $8,000 playing head-to-head -head limit hold'em against Pokey Pierce. <laughs> and I would... I mean, almost impossible because Puggy was probably cheating as well. <laughs> just, just, to make it, just, just to add to the degree of difficulty of this, you know. No, it, was, it was like trying to climb Everest and they've taken your shoes off you. But he, yeah. but he still beat them. Incredible, yeah. The, um, yeah, definitely uh, an, int an interesting time. Um, the uh, The just the game seeing see, seeing the game kind of uh grow grow during that uh during that era um you as, as well as well as playing in ireland uh you would have played in london and paris a bit um kind of in the in the 90s um compared with with maybe dublin um what what was the poker climate like in uh in those cities during that time well uh dublin in the uh the early 90s was pretty grim uh mm -hmm. you know there'd be maybe two clubs i think at that time there was the the marion i don't know what it was called at the time and um uh rap mines and then later there was uh the jackpot but uh you know they'd be competing with each other and um mm -hmm. you know there wasn't enough for, for one club let alone two so the, the poker games used to be pretty grim because uh, if you wanted to make a living playing poker back in those days, um, you had to either beat half the Irish team to pay your rent yeah. or, uh, or, or you had to take money off nice guys that you liked. So um, a lot of Irish pros got out of Ireland at the time. Uh, Tom Ryan went to London, Tom Gibson went to London, Ramin Sai went to London. Uh, I went to Paris for a fortnight and stayed 20 years. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I mean, going from Dublin to Paris was, was extraordinary. I mean, uh, it was, it, you went from playing poker against guys you liked and uh and didn't even want to be so cause any misery to to going yeah. over to playing against a whole load of guys who had a whole load of money and you didn't like any of them i mean it was fantastic i mean it, it was the perfect crime you know the, the, the more oh yeah and, and, and there were pretty shit players back in the day i mean i know that the french are now up to speed but uh back in the 90s it, it was oh it was dreadful 
Uh, what, I mean, what, what, I, what kind I, of games did you play? Uh, they were playing, um, it was mostly dealer's choice. Okay. Uh, you could be playing uh, Omaha, five card Omaha, high low, this core cheval, mm. which is like five card Omaha, but you get to see the first card on the flop. Uh, low ball, um, whatever they wanted. To <laughs> leave the masters. You weren't too concerned. No, no, no. It was, I mean, it, it was, it, it was, I mean, it wasn't that I was very good. It was just that uh, I think I, I gave up the drink at one stage and, and won twenty eight days in a row, uh, which is almost impossible. Like, but. Um, Giving up the drink. Well, I mean, twenty-eight days in a row. If, if, if the game was like that, I mean, well, obviously, the bench in the. Oh no, drink no. <laughs> well, I used to. Well, people don't believe me, but I, I used to give up drink every year on the first of January. Uh, I think for about twelve years, I wouldn't have a drink until I got knocked out of the main event at the World Series of Poker. And I did that 12 for 12 years in a row. Now, I guarantee you, you could find 20 guys who would tell you they got drunk with me sometime between January and, and July in one of those years. And I guarantee you they'd be lying because for, for the 12 years, I didn't have one drop in those months, mm. not one drop. And uh, guys, we said, God, do you remember the time we got drunk at the Irish Open? And no. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was what going a, to say what, what a time we used to have at the World Series. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, when Mad Marty Wilson was on his deathbed a few months ago, uh, Jesse May and I went to see him, and he was talking about the great time we used to have at the bar in Binion back in the day. Think about the what great time! I was never there. <laughs> I was either at the poker table and, and in, 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 in the coffee shop or I was in bed. <laughs> but the man was dying, so I, I, I gave him a walk on that one. Fair play. Yeah, the, the memory the memory can play tricks on people at some times. I think they can, uh, you know, the, um, especially, especially, I think the, I was going to say that the, um, between January 1st and the, the WSOP main events, the Irish Open does always fall in in that period. So um, uh, if you weren't drinking at the Irish Open, I'm sure uh, every single other person was. So uh, everybody else's memory may be a bit flawed uh, from that period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to speak a bit about the, the 1999 uh, WSOP in a moment, but... Um, even in the even in the years before that, uh, there was a big Irish contingent that was part of the the Vegas culture and the WSOP culture at the time. Um, we 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 spoke a bit about Terry Rogers bringing over the Americans and um, him forming his connection with Benny Binion, who was the the main poker man in Vegas at the time. Um, what was when was your first trip to to Las Vegas? Uh, I think it was. It was whatever year uh, Dan Harrington won the World Series. I think it was 95. Yeah, no, I think 95. Yeah, I think it was 95. Yeah. I think it was 95, something yeah. like that. But uh, I'd gone on a bit of a roll in, the, in Ireland for a few months. And uh, we had a few quid. And so Scott Gray and I headed over. Like Scott was a good, uh, veteran going back uh, a number of years. Scott was nearly there when nobody was going. Mm. But God, I, I walked into this place, Binion's, um, you know, about, I think it was maybe 12 o'clock at night. And um, God, it was, it, I was like a kid walking into Disneyland. And uh, Scott and I walked in the door and there was this oldest gentleman and he was up at the reception desk and uh, oh, he was losing the rag completely because they had made a mistake and thrown him out of his hotel room. So I think maybe he'd made the mistake and forgot to extend it. But uh, I said to Scott, do you think we'll go to get a room? And Scott said, no, I don't think so. He said, that gentleman arguing with the girl behind the desk, <laughs> that's Doyle Brunson. 
and I'll shit you. Okay, <laughs> probably not going to get a room then. But I, uh, I mean, the place was absolutely magical, and um, you know, the World Series was only like uh, uh, three weeks long at the time, and so uh, Scott and I, like, we didn't have a huge bankroll, but we had way more than we had six weeks before that. So uh, we came up with a plan. Uh, Scott would get up in the morning and play 12 hours. And then uh, I'd play the graveyard for 12 hours. So we kept the bankroll in, in action 24 hours a day. Mm. We'd, we'd just hand the bankroll over from one to the other. And um, it worked out very well. And that was it. I was sold on, uh, on Vegas after that. But it wasn't just that, that, that you know, we won quite well, won quite well at the time. But it was just, I think, um, it was just magical. Uh, I think uh, Helmet won three bracelets. Ivy won three bracelets. Or was it Ted Forrest? Two people won three bracelets. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, Ivy, Ivy, and Ted Forrest definitely won multiple bracelets in in, in years. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head who won three though. Yeah. Well, the funny one was, I think uh, at the end of the trip, uh, we'd, um, we, we'd, we'd put the money in the box and uh, decided to have, to have a few days drinking. And uh, we, were, uh, we were over buying some new underwear in, the, um, in, the, in the, well, one of the shops there on Fremont Street. And Scott introduced me to another man who was purchasing underwear. And he told me that his name was Dan Harrington. Okay. And uh, so we were chatting away to Dan. And Dan had won, I think it was 3,000 No Limit Hold'em or 2,500 No Limit Hold'em uh, a couple of days before that. And, uh, and he was bitching about uh, <laughs> that he'd won a super satellite earlier in the trip. And he had tried to, uh, he wasn't even looking for the money back. He tried to postpone it till the following year because he was too tired. And he bitched away about this. And he's just won, like, I don't know, maybe 100,000 or 150,000. He's bitching about having to play the main event, but he's tired. So uh, we headed for home. And uh, four days later, uh, Dan Harrington was the world champion. <laughs> and, I mean, it just goes to show you that, you know, in poker, anything can happen. The guy that don't want to play the tournament has ended up winning a million dollars and he's world champion. And we know what kind of underwear he was wearing. <laughs> uh, but, the... you know, he tells, he tells a great story about that, that uh, he phoned his, his mother. And I think uh, well, Dan was a cousin of Porrick Harrington's. Mm. And Porrick had finished second, you know, Jesus, I don't know how many times. It might have been seven, eight times. It was certainly up around that in, in European golf tournaments. Mm. And then, uh, and then uh, Porig won the, um, the Malaga Open or the Madeira Open or some Some shit. European tour uh, event. Some European tour yeah. event, you know, like for 57,000 or something. So Dan is ringing the mammy. And he's trying to tell her he's won a million in the, the World Series. And, she, and, he's, and he's going, great news, Mom. I won the World Championship yesterday. I got a million dollars. She said, did you hear about Porrick? Everybody's all excited. All the family are on the phone. There's going to be a big party. He won 57,000 in Malaga. Some got the play. Dan said, yeah, 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 but uh, I won a million. And his mother said, and everybody's all excited. They're on the phone. And he said, oh, yeah, just tell him I said, I said congratulations. <laughs> Like I, I have spent several mornings walking around Dublin. I, I finally managed to persuade uh, Dan to come over and play the Irish Open. Paddy Powers had asked me to, yeah, because uh, I, I, I was kind of the face of the Irish Open in America back then, and I, I persuaded Dan to come over, and uh, he finally relented and came over, but. Uh, we couldn't get rid of him after that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Paddy Powers had asked him to come over once, but Dan you've been there for years since. Four or five years since, yeah, and uh, which was a real pain in the arse because he used to get me up at nine o'clock in the morning, and we go walking all around Dublin, and you know the guy's a multi-zillionaire, like 
and we'd be in second-hand bookshops and the books they'd done. And we could have done with a bit of sleep. But I mean, that, that, that was the magic the Irish Open had then. You know, uh, mm. we got a lot of guys to come over and um, like uh, Sexton's been there a few times. He absolutely loves it. Uh, Negriano was there. He had a ball. Mm. And uh, I brought him up to, oh, what's the name of the club? It, it, it closed about a year later. The Voodoo Club. Oh, yeah, the Voodoo Club. I, I was, this was after I'd, I'd stopped doing, doing the no drinking for the first six okay. months of the year. And, and then Daniel, Daniel and I got locked in the Burlington. And uh, the, next, the next morning, Daniel phoned me and uh, he said, well, what time do we have to be at that club? I said, what club? What are you talking about? He said, no, he said, well, you rang a guy last night and you said that we'd be there um, to, uh, uh, to, meet, to meet the small players in Dublin. I said, who did I ring? He said, well, the guy that owns the club. <laughs> I said, well, okay, well, uh, hang on. Then I made a phone call. It turned out that uh, it was me who'd lost my mind, not Daniel. And, uh, and Daniel came down to the Voodoo Club. Now, th uh, this is the magic of the Irish Open. Yeah. I mean, he came down and there was, you know, these guys were used to playing five or rebuy tournaments or 10 or, I mean, 20 quid would be like, you know, the club championship, like. And uh, the place was chock a block of people in there to, uh, to meet Daniel. And he was there for two or, I brought Channing along with us as well, just in case we needed anybody to do a bit of talking. And uh, after, after yourself and Daniel weren't enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it proved to be a good move because I mean, Daniel was there. He did all the photographs, the, the autographs. We played an exhibition. I let Daniel win. And um, <laughs> after about two hours, I said to Daniel, "Come on, we're going across the road for a pint." And he said, "But there's still people here." And I said, "Well, that's why we brought Channing." <laughs> he can keep them going for another two or three hours. Absolutely no problem. So we headed across the road and had a pint and we got followed over by half the punters from the club, but he was fantastic with them. You know, we were very lucky in that, you know, like Mike is a great ambassador for the mm. game. Um, he fitted in lovely with the Irish. Of course, he'd been in Galway too with them with the party poker thing. And... Uh, when Doyle came over, he was fantastic. So um, we were kind of lucky over the years with some of the big name Amer the, the big name Americans that came. And well, of course, Dan was great as well. But the big name Americans that came weren't just big names; they were big name ambassadors as well. Yeah. So uh, it was fantastic stuff. Like yeah, I think all all, all very personable uh, characters as well. Um, I said and and. I know they're 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 probably going to say they enjoyed it whether they did or not, but um, definitely like yeah, Brunson, Negreanu, Helmut was over. Um, I, uh, Doyle Brunson. Helmut didn't enjoy it. No, I mean, well, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> of course, Helmut Helmut may be tougher to please though. Is that is that is that fair to say? Well, I don't know. I I think um, I think on the the Sunday night at the Irish Open. I, Helmets just got knocked out. I, I was uh, walking through the lobby of the hotel and I was the only one that Helmet could find that he knew. Like, I actually got on well with Phil. And he started, and he started to wait till I tell you. And uh, I said, if this is your exit hand, I said, don't fucking bother. I don't care. I said, I got knocked out on Friday. So, so uh, we went off and uh, had a few points watching the and the final round at the, the U.S. Masters. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, I remember by, the year, uh, actually, you know, yeah. Like Nicky Power and Julian Gardner and guys like that. Yeah, but, I mean, Helmick came in, didn't put his hand in his pocket. He's had four points, and then he said he's going to bed. <laughs> what, 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 what's this guy doing here? <laughs> <laughs> He could at least buy a route. <laughs> but, you know, Helmut, Helmut, Helmut just didn't get it. Whereas, like, uh, Negriano, Sexton, Doyle, and uh, yeah. Dan, 
they got it in an instant. You know, it was uh, it was in their blood. Yeah. I mean, Helmut just Helmut just wanted to be adored. I mean, the other guys were wondering like, where's the crack? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I remember the years Negreanu and Brunson were there, and um, it, like you know, they they were in the bar, they were socialising like like many of us Joe, do that 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 week of the year. And um, uh, I remember Br- Brunson was particularly uh, he was a big fan of the the Irish brown bread. I remember the the you know the famous uh, soda bread that we created. Oh, yeah. he, he was a big fan of that. But um, it's uh, it, it was great to see. I you know I I think. Us, us Irish people have a high opinion of our um our um I suppose you know the the, the our welcoming and our uh, you know we're I think we're good good socializers and um it was definitely good to see that uh I, I do think they appreciate it and it's it just I, I do feel again being biased but uh, the Irish Open is such a unique event and uh the this year in particular you know the first year we've been without it um it's definitely something you'd miss, um, not just from a poker point of view, but from a, a social aspect and getting to see people and getting to have a bit of crack with people. It's such a such a unique event. Well, uh, I've got a great Doyle Brunson story from, from the Irish Open he was here for. Mm. Uh, at, at that year's, or the previous year's main event in Vegas, uh, I was on a TV table with uh, uh, Brunson and a few other guys. I think, uh, oh, your man, Barconi, who'd won the, who was the reigning world champion, but, but that's another yeah. look. But uh, <laughs> I was at the table with Brunson, and uh, I heard Brunson having a phone conversation, and it turned out that his old basketball uh, buddies were going to be in time um in, in town that night and doyle had got the date wrong and this might be the last time like he ever met them and i'm mere wigging this and i'm like well <laughs> so uh and doyle is going oh shit i'm, I'm playing the main event so <laughs> about half an hour later i mean doyle way over bet this uh, before the flop and we've ended up, I raised King, but I mean, I was pretty sure Doyle didn't have too much because I knew he wanted to get knocked out. Yeah. So I called him at the Ace King, like I had a royal flush, like, and, um, you know, it was for all the chips. I mean, two hours into the tournament, it was ridiculous. Like, and Brunson has King nine. So uh, anyway, Brunson's knocked out. And uh, so it's now 12 months later, we're at the Irish Open. Uh, Paddy Powers had me doing a bit of uh, hosting with Brunson. Mm. So uh, Brunson and I are hanging around and it's a kind of a meet the press thing, which basically meant that Doyle would be asked 40 questions by journalists and I'd <laughs> sit there like an idiot. <laughs> that would be wondering who the fuck is your man? <laughs> which, which is exactly what happened. But while we were waiting, Brunson, I mean, this is, you know, the depth these um, big, big champions will go to, like. Mm. Brunson's sitting there and he said, yeah, he said, oh, by the way, he said, uh, remember that hand from the World Series last year? I said, yeah. And he said, I just want you to know that I, he said, that hand only happened because I got a phone call telling me I was supposed to be out for dinner that night with my old basketball buddies. So got it. I said, you don't have to tell me, Doyle, I heard the phone call. I said, why do you think we got this all in? And he just, but I mean, uh, he just wanted me to know that, I mean, this guy is a great, great champion. I mean, he's one of the most famous poker players of all time. And some Irish guy has knocked him out of the World Series. Yeah. <laughs> but Doyle wanted me to know that, uh, that, that it wasn't fair and square, that uh, I only knocked him out because he wanted to get knocked out. I mean, if you want to know, you know how the mind of the champion works, well, there it is. Like, 12 yeah. months later, I mean, the guy is 140 years old and he still don't want me going strutting around saying I knocked Brunson out. Yeah. 
uh yeah the fact uh yeah it's very funny the fact that you'd uh as you said you were aware of the situation yourself you didn't uh oh, yeah. you didn't decide to mention that to him though well i told him about it 12 months later <laughs> <laughs> You, uh, a lot of these guys, as you said, uh, a lot of these, you know, they were always well-known poker players, guys like Brunson and Helmuth and Negreanu and even Devilfish and, as you said, Mike Sexton. Um, they were well-known players kind of in their own respect. And then over the course of less than a decade kind of turned into absolute superstars. Um, did you notice, did, did you feel there was any kind of shift in pers personalities from kind of before, say, kind of the poker boom to after when these guys became big, big celebrities? Um, well, you know, I, I met Sexton in, uh, I think it was in July 96 at the European Championships in London. And um, you know, we used to all stay in the Metropole Hotel there and uh, when we were playing in the Vic. And uh, Mike came in one night, you know, at three o'clock in the morning and uh, there was 10 of us there having a drink. And at 11 o'clock the next morning, there was just me and Mike. And um, Mike uh, was one of the, the, the greatest visionary in poker, like, without a doubt. I mean, Mike was... Uh, telling me what was going to happen yeah. over the next five years. And I was just laughing at him, thinking this guy's the nut job. I mean, he's a very nice nut job. I mean, and he's the only guy I have to drink with at the moment. So I'm going to have to listen to it, a little bit more of it. But I mean, um, but I mean, he seemed so passionate yeah. and, uh, and, and convinced that he was right. You know, it's not like uh, he said this might happen or this could be coming. He said it will. He yeah. said, in five years' time, you're going to be a TV star. <laughs> Jesus, who's round is it anyway? Like, you know, um, but uh, I mean, he's, he, the only mistake he made was that he only saw 10% of what was coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. He didn't foresee the, the explosion, but you know, the explosion changed a lot of things. Um, the whole style of poker changed. It became. Hmm. Um, I mean, it used to be a game of uh, psychology, and uh, and now it's much more match driven. And basically, as Jesse May would say, well, no, uh, no limit hold'em is solved. Um, mm. I think it's a, it's it's yeah, it's certainly a game that's as I said, the 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 technical aspect of the game has changed an awful lot. Uh, I, I still personally think a lot is. You know, a lot is made of the you know the GTO way of playing and the solvers and all that. Um, but live poker, especially, uh, I still think it's it's largely a, a psychological element. Um, do you still feel the same, or do you think the game has changed? Well, thank God for that. I'm not sure I feel the same, but I hope it is. <laughs> I'm, well, obviously, well, I think you know, internet poker um, has become an internet game. That's loosely ga it's loosely based on poker, but yeah. a lot of it is nothing to do with poker. I mean, um, yeah, I I I I think uh, online poker is going. It's a lot closer to uh, to what chess is like. I think if you want to play chess, um, there's there's a right answer or a very close to right answer in a lot of situations, and there's not much room for error. I think online poker is definitely moving towards. Uh, that way at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, well, chess is solved as well, I think. Yeah, um, effectively. Yeah. Th there's, uh, you know, you have 27 options and only one of them is right and that's it. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't know which one, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and it, well, like online poker has become very much like that. Um, with all the hoods and the, the hand histories. I mean, it's, um, you know, it can still be very enjoyable, but I mean, playing mm. at poker is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's fair to say. It, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly changed. Like, well, you know, live poker is so much more fun. I mean, it, mm. I fell in love with poker. Um, it's not that I didn't like the money, but I mean, I, it, it was the crack. Yeah. And uh, the competitive phone element and the slagging and the... Uh, 
the camaraderie and the few points afterwards that uh, I mean, it, like, like I liked the game, but it, it was it, yeah. it was the crack that surrounded it that got me addicted. And, um, and after that, my life was gone. <laughs> I was, it yeah. was too late now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I, I feel, I feel similar. I think it's um, that that's why you know so, something like you know, the Irish Open week being the the perfect example. It's uh, it's something that. Well, you mean you'd be a bit of a fan of the crack yourself now if you don't mind saying. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I don't, I, I, blow, I, I don't want to blow your cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I agree completely. Um, the, the that's 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 what I always say to people at the table. I said. Uh, Joe, you know, we're all here to we're all here to take each other's money, and uh, that's extremely important. But uh, it is it's it's the people you meet and the characters you meet is uh, is definitely. I I think there's nothing like it. Finding such a wide range of characters is uh, I think is absolutely brilliant in the game. Well, you know, I uh, I spent about two and a half years going around Ireland when the party poker came to Ireland in the first place, mm. and. Uh, I talked Rob Young into um, putting on uh, the Grand Prix in Killarney. Yeah. And uh, well, Killarney, I, I by, sorry myself. to cut across you. The, yeah, Killarney, by the way, I think is um, uh, an, an absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant venue for poker. It's uh, it's a shame that it, they seem, it seems logistically quite tough to get people there, but the, the Glen Eagles is uh, one of my favorite places to play poker. There's something in the water down there and the crack there is absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Well, you know, I spent about four or five months going around Ireland just promoting that mm. Killarney event. And people, uh, I mean, you're 100% right. It is great crack. Everybody knew it was great crack from back in the in the Ladbrokes days Ladbrook, down yeah. there. And uh, people were saying it was so hard to get to. And I said, well, have you, have you been to Vegas? Oh, yeah, I was there last year. So it'll only take you a third of the time to get to Killarney. <laughs> Very fair <laughs> point. But, but once people get, get to Killarney, they forget. How, I mean, it's just, it's like Brigadoon down there. Like, it's, yeah. you know, the whole world outside ceases to exist. If It's like everybody's been told the world is going to be over on Wednesday. And they say, yeah, fair enough. What do you have <laughs> like, you know? And, well, it was fantastic, but like I spent like uh, well over two years in total. I think I mean just traveling the country. I played in nearly every pub game around Ireland, mm. from uh, Belfast to Skibbereen to Dungarvan to Athlone to uh, uh, Clifton, mm. and uh, the crack. Uh, play, I mean, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind, but that uh, poker in Ireland. Is um, is by far the best crack ever, <laughs> and the and the guys who were playing the, the clubs, and uh, and the big tournaments and all that, that it's great fun and everything. But they should all take a bit of time every year and go down the country and play with the lads down there because yeah. it's, just, it's absolutely mad. Like, I mean, I mean, you're just laughing all day. But I mean, it's a fantastic game for getting people together. You know, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and 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 there's some places in Ireland that poker is all they have. Um, you know, uh, there's a guy called uh, Simon O'Hara in uh, in Clifton, and um, he asked me would I go down. Um, because he was having a poker tournament in aid of uh, Pieter House, uh, the suicide people, mm. because, um, uh, you know, in the west of Ireland, there was a lot of uh, suicide among the, you know, the 20 something uh, young guys yeah. who would be in a big overlap with um, the poker playing community. And he was running a charity and an awareness raising um, thing down there. And uh, so I got, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, Eamon Connolly, uh, who knew a little bit about suicide because he was a bit too close to us. But mm. uh, he came down with me and we had a fantastic night down there. And, uh, and, uh, and I made a speech uh, uh, about suicide and Pieta House and all of that. I hadn't a clue what I was talking about. 
But just by chance, the, uh, in the in the course of the next year, my little sister committed suicide. Oh, sorry, so, sorry. Uh, so that so so the next time I went I went down to the suicide event in Clifton, I was a little more knowledgeable. Yeah, Jesus, and, yeah, um, yeah. and uh, but I, I, w- I was also much more aware that in you know sort of um, rural communities in Ireland. You know, which we all see in the, you know, in the heat of the summer mm. when all the crack is going on and the music in the pubs and the whole lot that, you know, once November comes in, there's a lot of uh, people there with nothing to do and mm. um, and the social life can be very limited. So I think that um, poker can be uh, a huge influence in, first of all, um, giving guys an outlet for a night or two a week for, you know, a cheap night out. You yeah. know, go and play a 20 quid tournament in the pub, like you might even win one, or um, which which gets them out. Guys that are living on their own, you know, looking out into that darkness at night. And uh, it also gives uh, an opportunity for the awareness to be created that uh, people who do have... Um, who do, do feel under pressure and do feel that they're on their own, they're not. Yeah. There's, uh, there's help available and as much as they want. So I think, you know, you hear an awful, an awful lot of bad, um, poker gets a lot of bad press. Mm. But, um, you know, it can do an awful lot of good at the same time. Yeah. And there is a balance there. Like, and it, it can be a big part of the social life and, uh, and, the reason for staying alive for some guys yeah 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 very well said um i yeah i i couldn't agree more um as i said i think a lot of these things uh poker it's very easy for poker or gambling to make its way into the media when you know very bad things happen and addiction causes problems but for you know, the vast majority of people uh it's it's an excellent social outlet uh i know plenty of guys that's it's it's just i joy i'd i'd recommend it to anyone from the point of view of again you know you have to be able to enjoy the you know I, i'm always wary that addiction can be an issue for people but um if if you can manage it well uh, i couldn't agree more i think it's such a such an excellent um social outlet um cover joe there's a friend of mine he's 60 years older than me and uh before before the corona now until all this hit he was uh joe he was still playing poker multiple nights nights a week and it's just uh i i think it's absolutely brilliant for people and it gives you a the camaraderie at the poker table i find is it's some of the most genuine um interactions you can have with people because whether joe whether you're young or old or rich or poor joe if you bad beat someone you know, they'll call you a cunt the same as they call anyone else a cunt. So I think that kind of, uh, <laughs> that back and forth crack it's is, a great uh, leveler, it's, isn't it? yeah, it's pe- people aren't, um, you know, it, it's very real, genuine, um, you know, social interactions, which I think is, is, is so, so important uh, uh, in the world today, you know. I couldn't agree more. I yeah. mean, it's, it, it, it can do a lot of good. Uh, you know, with, like with, with poker for the homeless, uh, I think we've raised like three hundred thousand for uh, mainly for Brother Kevin. Yeah. And uh, I remember I asked Brother Kevin to come into the jackpot one night and uh, just say a few words. Um, and uh, he said fine. And they just started the tournament, and I can remember Brother Kevin. And we gave him the microphone. So this little guy from Cork, I mean, he's about four foot two, I think. And uh, with a very softly spoken voice, just started talking. And uh, in a very low voice, and you could have heard a pin drop like in the place. And uh, he started off his speech by saying that uh, uh, he was totally opposed to gambling because it, that created a lot of the problems that he had to clean up after. But then in this particular um, situation where, where it was fundraiser, he was going to make an exception. And he spoke for about two or three minutes and uh, 
there was complete silence in the room. And then I got a guy to take him across the road to the pub and buy him a cup of tea. And guys were coming up to me from all over the room and putting money in my pocket. Mm. And uh, staying here, that's for that man. He's a great man. And uh, I went over to the pub and I'm, I'm giving a whole bunch of money to Brother Kevin. And he says, well, he says, where did that come from? I said, I said, I didn't ask. I said, I know where it's going. That's good enough for me. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like there was hardened criminals in there kept in their pockets. Yeah. Like it was for the it, little man from Cork, like uh, amazing stuff. Like it is, yeah, uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think the I think the poker community and the gambling community, where um, mo- money can come and go so easily to us, that um, the one thing I will say, I, I think it's it's quite it's quite a generous community um, deep down. You know, people. I think uh, Joe, a lot of people feel they mightn't be contributing to society in the best way, but they're, you know, if it's just a question of money, money is so unimportant to so many gamblers that they are quite generous. And often, as I said, we're, we're in and out of money the whole time, but uh, Joe, often people don't have the means to, but uh, when they do, uh, I definitely find the, the poker community is, uh, is more than happy to help. Um, and it's, it's, I think people oh, have God, yeah. good I hearts. Mean, you know? I, I would never hear a word said against the, uh, the Irish poker players because I've often asked them to help in these things. Yeah. And every single time they step up to the plate. And, uh, you know, and the help comes from the most amazing places, like the, the, the places you'd least expect. Yeah. Um, just all of a sudden, and nobody's looking for any thanks or the hooch buying. It's very funny. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, just want to speak a bit, Park, about the the your your finest, well, arguably your finest hour in poker, the uh, the nineteen ninety nine uh, World Series of Poker main event. Um, so you you were kind of saying earlier yourself and Scott Gray went over a few years previous, and you were playing cash games out of the same bankroll. Um, the build up to the main event in nineteen ninety nine was it a similar story? Had you were you there for the three weeks? Were you playing cash games? Uh, what was the kind of build up uh, to that the the final event of the series? Uh, well, you're probably not going to believe this, but um, it it was completely different in that uh, I had given up cigarettes uh, in February and was. Um, like I was flying at the time, playing in Paris, but I'd given up cigarettes in February and the concentration levels weren't too good. Okay. So uh, Scott and I were in Vegas, you know, we were still doing the share in the same room, even though it was only 25 bucks a night because we weren't going to break the, the losing, the winning system. But uh, Scott was doing all the playing. I was sitting up in the room, uh, you know, Everybody was asking Scott what's pouring do. No, he's up in the room uh, betting on the basketball playoffs. Now, the, the truth is, I was, but like I, I was betting fifty bucks on the TV game. Like, yeah, I, like I didn't know anything about it. But uh, I just um, I played very very little because uh, I didn't trust myself. That nicotine addiction is pretty strong. <laughs> like. So when the um, I think I, I played the Omaha tournament and I might have played another a small holding tournament, maybe a 1500 or something. But uh, when, the, when the main event came around, uh, well, we, we weren't absolutely flying, but we were well ahead. We were enough ahead on the trip to pay all the expenses, stick yeah. me into the main event. And uh, and still go home making a few quid. Yeah. Oh, and always I, a good spot to be in going into the main event. It was, but I mean, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't want to do it, and uh, I just thought. I mean, four days. I can't do that. Like, I mean, I'm. Yeah. Uh, I, was just, I was just totally jittery, like. But uh, Scott tried to talk me into it. I said, "No, don't worry. I play it next year. No bother. I just want to go home." Hmm. And then George McKeever stepped in, and uh, George and some other guy wanted to stick me in, and I said no. And I said to George, we have our own money, that if I wouldn't play with our money, I'm not going to play with yours. 
Mm. I said, and uh, he said, well, I, I said, it's, it's just not, I said, it, it'd be wasting money because uh, I can't stick the four days. It's impossible. Like, And uh, George said, well, okay. He said, I still want to gamble. You have to play. So I said, well, okay, if you want. So uh, it was kind of funny because then George had to borrow the money uh, from Donica uh, to stick me in. And Donica had to borrow the money from Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there playing the world the, the month of whose fucking money are we playing? <laughs> What's going on? Like, but uh, it was just a dream. Um, I was probably, it was the first time I'd played the main event, but uh, I was probably lucky because uh, I had um, uh, the devil fish on my right, whom I, whom I knew and was pretty friendly with, and uh, Ali Chakra, whatever you call him, on my left, who had already told us he was, he was going to be pass everything up to and, and and maybe possibly including Queen. And uh, and that's exactly what he did. So we were banging away all day. The fish had by in Rob Alley. I'd really raised the fish and <laughs> so it kept going on. And uh, the fish kept telling me what great cards I was getting them. I was telling them, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then, but I had a kind of a I had a good first day. I was on the first page of the leaderboard, which was always good back in the day. Mm. Um, and it kind of went on from there. And there was uh, there was a big Irish presence in it. I think there was like 400 players. Six of them were Irish. But uh, um, the Irish did pretty good. Yeah, the four, uh, yeah, four, four, four Irish caches. Um, Mickey Finn finished fourteenth, George McKeever seventh, uh, yourself third, and Noel Farlong then uh, won it. So, four having four Irish caches that deep in the main event is uh, is uh, an excellent return. Yeah, yeah, but it was very funny because I think like maybe three or four tables out, I was sitting beside beside George, who had stuck me in, and. Uh, I mean, and George is as honest a guy as you could come across. So uh, I was robbing George blind, and he knew. And yeah. uh, so then George figured the only way out of this mess was if if I was playing like I wasn't looking at my cards, he wasn't going to look at his either. So. It ended up with me and the guy who stuck me in battling each other until we both gave up after a while and just just got on with playing against the Americans. But if it just, I think it, it probably helped that um, uh, there was so many Irish there, and uh, you know you're looking around with a few tables left, and uh, and you you know half the guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Furlong had uh, had flown in like about a week before the World Championship, and he spent most of the week uh, at the snack bar in in Binion's, uh drinking coffee with me. Um, who was also I was just hanging around doing nothing as well. Yeah, <laughs> I was just hanging around waiting to go home. So it kind of finished up kind of funny, but I mean, I mean, um, the whole thing was just. Uh, an unbelievable buzz. Yeah, you know, I was in the money after three days or whatever, and that was. I going into the third day. Maybe we were all in the money. Yeah, would, yeah. Would, I didn't think that was it. Any drama around the bubble? Is there, do you remember um, kind of when the bubble burst or anything like that from the tournament? No, no, <laughs> no. Because uh, no, I think I was, I was going all right. Yeah, never I was under never, pressure. Uh, I, I, there, there was one time in the middle of the second day where uh, I, I bet big on the turn and I've got absolutely nothing. And uh, while well, the other guy was thinking about it, I was thinking about it. And uh, I said, I don't care what he does. If he goes, this is all going in on the river. <laughs> I mean, I'm not leaving these chips behind. But thankfully he passed. That was the drama. 
but on on the on the third day, I, um, I think I, I won every pot for the first three quarters of an hour, and um, I don't know what happened. I think I just lost my mind. If anybody raised, I re raised, <laughs> and it was just, and and then and then I hit a few cards in the middle of it. I won a huge pot with uh, aces against queens. And all of a sudden, I had a million in chips, which was a huge. I mean, there was only four million in play. I think. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, so, so I'd, I'd, I'd hit the front. Um, you know, from starting the day with sixty thousand, like in a few hours, I'd gone from sixty thousand to a million. Wow. I started thinking, Jesus, I'm going to win this. <laughs> but, uh, it didn't turn. I mean, there were still some great players in it. I mean. Mm -hmm. There was a, the, yeah. the final table was, was a mass. I mean, I, I was sorry to see George get knocked out. Um, he, he got well. He, he got the real bad deal because he got knocked out in seventh. So even though he'd made the final table, he didn't make the last day. Oh, okay. It was the, the final six were the final six came back for the the the, the final day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, so George was <laughs> for long not George out. <laughs> And uh, um, I'd like to say the TV camera didn't see me smiling, didn't catch me smiling. But I mean, I, I was smiling because I was at the last table, not because my friends had got knocked out. I mean, I'd rather it hadn't happened. And I hope he'd forgive me for it. <laughs> but but um, I mean, what a buzz. I mean, going in for that final day, and to hear uh, Mr. Thompson, the tournament director, saying, you know, um, saying your name from Dublin, Ireland. Oh, my God. Mm. I mean, and uh, then just to make it worse, uh, Mike Sexton's arrived in and he's brought uh, Stewie's daughter. Because uh, Stewie had died during the previous year. Mm. So um, Mike was... Uh, Doing a bit of a eulogy for Stewie, and Stewie's daughter was uh, going, Oh my God, I mean, this is emotional mm. enough. Yeah, yeah. Without this shit, <laughs> leave it out, Mike. But if, I mean, it was just surreal, like, and uh, it was uh, it was awesome. And then, like, we managed to, uh, we managed to get rid of uh, Seidel. And Hook Seed, I mean, who were two of the best players in yeah. the world. I mean, with the Americans, they'll never forgive us for that. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I think Seidel was all in with me, with Ace Queen against my Ace King. And Seidel flops a Queen, and the crowd went mad. And then I rivered a King. And I mean, it was like I fucking shot him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, Oh God Almighty! I mean, I remember going up to the room with Scott, where there's no three of us left, and Scott is saying, "Jesus, you're going to win this." And I said, "Well, it's, it's not as easy as you think. You know, we might have got rid of those two, but they're still four long." And uh, oh, just I forget the other guys. Alan, 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 Alan Goring. Alan Goring, yeah. Alan Goring, yeah. Sorry, Alan. Uh, <laughs> And that, well, Alan was very unorthodox, so he was a very aggressive player, wasn't he? A very uh... he was a very aggressive kind of small ball player. I mean, which was unusual for 1998. Mm. Um, I mean, he absolutely tortured Seidel at the second last table the night before, like and uh, like nobody had ever heard of Alan Goring, but uh, it, it was no fluke. I mean, he. Um, mm. Well, he went on to win the big WPT and uh, and uh, play a lot of big events, the big WPT events. I mean, I think he was given at least as, as much as he was getting. Like, um, yeah. But um, he talked to Seidel. And um, so, like, I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but it all, it all went wrong in the end. But in... It was a poker tournament. It, it, it can always happen. Um, yeah, only so much. I you think can I, I ran what was at the time was the biggest bluff of all time, <laughs> with absolutely nothing. And uh, Furlong called me with a flush dog. 
he also had an ace. He told me afterwards he only called me because he said it was the ace that made him call, not the flush. So I'm thinking, Jesus, I've lost the world championship to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Um, I didn't I, say it out loud. Going out on all guns blazing, uh, would you have? Would you have had it any other way? Would, uh, would, would do you regret? Uh, do you regret any of the hands? Would you have rather gone out with a bad beast, or how, how do you feel about no. it? No, I just I went out the way I decided to play it. Um, yeah, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I mean, you can't complain. It's, it's a poker yeah. tournament that I wasn't supposed to be in. Didn't want to play, and uh, well, the Irish guys. Whoever was involved in the thing, we won half a million between us. I mean, it's, it's, it'd, be very, it'd be very naughty to start saying, well, God, that was unlucky. <laughs> you know, went in, went in all guns blazing and went out all guns blazing. That was, that was the plan. It was, it was a very Irish kind of plan. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I, I, I think if you... I mean, it's it's all very well to to analyze after you've played a poker tournament, mm. and it's it's a good idea to admit the mistakes you made. But uh, to be beating yourself up and to uh, to have it eaten away at you, well, you know, maybe you should be doing something else. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I'm not smart enough to have regrets. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the the aftermath of the tournament. Uh, what was that like? Was it was it a big adrenaline dump? Uh, how, how did you feel in the kind of the days and the weeks after uh, this uh, this massive massive event? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it was uh, funny you should ask that because um, uh, like uh, a few years later, Scott got to the final table uh, with our friend Julian Gardner. Yeah. And we all kind of went through the same kind of thing. It was, you know, it's like you dig so deep in the middle of that thing, and the the, the adrenaline. When I mean, you're running on adrenaline for a few days, I mean, this is the biggest buzz of all time. Like, I mean, if you really love the game in particular, I mean, and uh, there's a big downer comes after it. Mm. Um, you know. Nothing dreadful, but you just, uh, you know, you, you're more liable to uh, tell somebody to shut the fuck up if they're annoying you. <laughs> like, you know, don't be, uh, I mean, uh, but there is, you know, you know, adrenaline is just borrowing, I suppose, and you have to pay it back. And mm. uh, if you have to pay it back through, uh, you know, if you're just a bit more short-tempered. And, um, apart from all the euphoria, the whole thing. Exactly. But you just, uh, you haven't had the buzz and they've taken it away from you. I, mean, I can see how people get hooked on on, on, on uh, heroin. Like, I mean, they only need one go. But funnily, like, I mean, they used to call Scott back in the day, they used to call him the Iceman. But when Scott went to the, the final table thing, um, a few short years later, um, and Scott would regard himself as, you know, maybe as cooler than he is. <laughs> but uh, I was talking to Scott's wife during the World Cup, and she she had said to me, well, that she offered some opinion to Scott on some match they were watching on the TV, and he bit the head off her. <laughs> it wouldn't be Scott's style. It's just... It, it is a bit of a downer uh, when you know when they when they've given you a look at the cake and then taken it off the table. Hmm. But I mean, I wouldn't mind doing this again. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's the the yeah the highs and lows is uh that it's it's all part of the game. And I said going into it, you know, you know, you know that's uh that's what's what's going to happen. Um, you know the the win loser draw mentality. It's it's very rarely in a poker tournament you come out on the win side of it. So uh, you just have to make make the best of it uh, for the, you know the moment it is and appreciate the the, the moments you get out of it. Um, well, final, I'm, final question. I'm, I, I was having a coffee with with Dan Harrington. Sorry, I was having a coffee with Dan Harrington in in LA a, a few years after that, and. Um, he was saying poker tournaments are very simple. Uh, you go to work every day, 
with the expectation that you're going to lose your money. <laughs> and and that's, that's just the way it is. So you go in, you play the best you can, and usually at some stage, somebody takes all your chips, and then you have to go off and, uh, and find something to do for the rest of the day, get on with your life. He said, and sometimes you have to go back a second day, and it takes them till halfway through the second day to take all your chips. And then you have to go on and go to the movies or whatever. He said, but every now and again, it's all worthwhile because you do exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, and they forget to take your chips. He said, and about three days after that, they're taking your picture and you've got a trophy and a whole bunch of money. He said, and you haven't, you're trying to tell everybody you haven't done any different to what you did in the previous hundred tournaments. <laughs> this was just, uh, well, I mean, it's very simplistic, but it's... Um, but no, but that's, that's, that's the game, Tr- trying to explain the game um, to, to kind of non-poker players. Uh, you know, how did you do today? It's like, well, I lost today, I lost today. And people are trying to read into, you know, you know is there a reason for you it? Lose you lose know? every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then that's why all the sweeter, the, the, the couple of days you do get to say you won. But uh, yeah, trying to explain to people that's just the way it goes. You're not necessarily doing anything different. It's not a, you know, you're not, you're not tired. It's not a psychological or emotional thing. You're not unprepared. You know the the structures hasn't haven't changed that much. It's just uh, just the way it goes. Yeah, and and what as Dan says, you've just got to accept it. Like, and if, if it's going to interfere with the rest of your life, we'll do something you're, else. Yeah, yeah, I think so. The you're you, yeah, you're uh, better off finding find, finding a better um, better lifestyle. I think because um, that's that is very much part of the the gambling world. Um, which uh, which which brings us brings us nicely onto onto our final question here for you, Park. You you've been involved in the game a long time. Um, what are some of the most important ingredients uh, in longevity in the in the gambling world, in your opinion? Drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I think. Uh, Well, first of all, you have to be good. Um, but, you know, a lot of guys uh, have, have, you know, young, young guys that say, well, I'm thinking to turn them pro. What, what would your advice be? And I'd say don't. It's too hard. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, uh, I mean, I got lucky in that I thought I was good enough or hoped I was good enough. And it turned out that over time I was nearly good enough, but um, that was just um, like how was I supposed to know that? Yeah, you know, and um, it's it's a lot harder than it looks. You know, people uh, they look at the TV and they see a guy winning two point four million dollars and say, "God, I mean, he didn't even raise a sweat." Like, you know, what an easy game, but they don't show you all the guys out at the airport. Who've yeah. done their brains that are kicking their suitcases, going, you know, how the fuck did I do that? But I mean, it's a very, very hard game to play over time. Um, you need to either not care or uh, or be in control of your emotions. I don't mean be a machine. Mm. I mean, um, because I think people who are machines are less likely to um to have the gamble in them that, that can be required on the big days. Mm. But uh, be balanced about it. And to, I mean, you have to accept it for what it is. And most importantly, if you decide that's what you're going to do with your life, um, you have to be prepared to accept the swings, the ups and downs, and, uh, and the bad days, and, uh, and not let it affect uh, your relationships with those around you, or or destroy your personality, or uh, or whatever. I mean, you just have to be mentally tough mm. and maybe realistic. Um, you know, you see guys going on when it's clear that they they don't have the mentality. You yeah. know, they may be very talented, 
um, but they don't have the mentality to deal with it and it's affecting them too much. I mean, that, that's when you quit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, no, the problem with poker is sometimes by the time you quit, you've made yourself unemployable. Um, <laughs> that can be a bit of an issue and that's maybe why... Uh, well, yeah, I think yeah. Why, why why I, tell, I, I tell guys just keep a day job, keep a CV going anyway. Um, like like have the safety net, or else there can be a lot of pain ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent advice. I think um, it's it's a very very oh, tough world to, to be in full time. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, you you know that. <laughs> I mean, you well. I mean, I've, I've seen you in action. I mean, you've got a very good disposition, but uh, that's uh, that's at least fifty percent of the of of what's needed. Yeah, and it's um, I said it's uh, only yeah part part of the the, the big picture. Uh, as you said, talking about to, to people considering turning pro or whatever word you want to use of this. Um, it's I there's such a criteria needed for it to be a good idea. And, and I think the biggest trouble in poker is even if it is, if it is a good idea, the, the individual is probably quite skilled and talented and smart and emotionally strong that they could be, they could make a lot more money in a different field. So um, that's oh, why exactly. I think it's I mean, such a difficult thing to recommend, uh, recommend someone to do. Well, you know, if, you know, there's things like wives and kids involved in the middle of the whole thing as well. Like, I mean, um, you might be prepared to put up with the with the ups and downs, but I mean, do you want your family to have to to have to ride that uh, that rodeo horse with you? You know, it's not fair to ask them. I mean, I mean, obviously there are some people around. I mean, who are capable of doing it, and they find wives who do it. But generally, you find that they're the winning players. <laughs> just, exactly. There's a lot of wives go missing in the middle of it. I mean, I mean, I'm not just joking. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah, you're you're, you're dead right. It's not worth losing your life over or your your real life over. Yeah, because uh, at the at the end of the day, it's just a game. Yeah, that's it. No, I uh, couldn't. I, I couldn't agree more with your park. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining me today, Park. Uh, if you want to follow Park on well, Twitter... Well, I have nothing else to do, Jamie. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the whole idea. I could be talking to you this Christmas. <laughs> It's uh yeah we've I've I've picked a convenient time to uh to you know nailing down poker players can often be difficult so um we picked uh, we picked a good time to try and get in some of these conversations. Yeah, what time next week? <laughs> <laughs> the series, uh, yeah, the the podcast series. Uh, if yeah, by all means, uh, if you enjoyed if you enjoyed Park today, if you've any questions for him, uh, by all means, uh, let me know and we we could do it again. Um, his Twitter, if you want to follow him, is at Park Poker. Uh, I'd highly recommend checking out uh, his blogs and articles if you want to hear more uh, stories similar to today. Uh, you can follow me at Jam underscore Five. Thank you, Jimmy. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, Park, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe. Look after yourself. And, My pleasure, uh, Jimmy.